to it and, and even sitting there in the audience uh, that you were encouraging this type of activity. And so, you know, I don't know what the public opinion of, was of the mayor at that point, but no matter what it was, it only really boosted turnout. And then on top of that, um, we got a communique sent to us another, about another local action, like the day before, if I remember correctly, the forum was, and so we did press right then there in Bloomington about this new action that had happened, and it was going to hit the news the same day that the forum started. So the place was packed um, with all kinds of people, and it wasn't just, it wasn't, act, I mean, there were not many activists. There were a lot of community people, um, a lot of people from the church, a lot of people from the university, a lot of people who, for whatever reason, found this issue fascinating or interesting. And uh, the debate was really you know, it's good. It's the kind of discussion that communities need to have. It's the kind of thing that, you know, if that type of thing happened all the time, we wouldn't have to be burning down buildings, you know. So that's, that's one thing that crossed my mind that night. Um, but during that time, I met Marie. Uh, we stayed at her house, and um, she and her daughter. And, you know, she was just, she's, she's older than me. You know, she's 50 now. I'm uh, 34 now. And, um, she had been involved in a lot of Earth First organizing, as was said earlier, a lot of uh, wildly organizing, and all kinds of good work for so long. And here, you know, I was the invited person out. I'm 20, I don't know what, super young. And, uh, and she's super experienced, and, and it really felt like I was the one that was learning a lot of stuff from her while I was out there. And just really taking in, a, you know, a lot of inspiration and um, lessons just from being around her and staying with her for the for the short time that I was there. And, um, and really made a lasting impression on me. And then, you know, we went on to do a couple other speaking engagements and it stuck with me and we kind of stayed in touch with her. And then she got, as was mentioned again, in the spring she got uh, raided by, Frank and her got raided by the, by the FBI. The government was claiming that they had found nails that matched, you know, or implying that they had matched the tree spiking nails. And they reached out to the press office again for support in their case, because they were going to fight it out. Frank, in particular, was being charged. And um, as was mentioned, that was the first time anyone was ever charged for Earth Liberation Front Actions. At that point, we had probably $50 million in damages. What is that, like three, four years, three and a half years of actions? A major spree of sabotage, very significant major spree of sabotage and nobody was being caught and um, and that was the first of it and that reaction that they were was relatively minor compared to most of them and so um, we were all about it and we, we put in a lot of work to, to support them in front of Portland and built a network, helped with the network that was existing already to do you know, international solidarity um, demonstrations for them and we called for a day of uh, action and solidarity and I think we probably used the term direct action because media flipped. Uh, but for us, I mean, in Portland, we were pretty busy, and what it was for us was that we were going to do a press conference um, outside of the federal courthouse at the same time that Frank was facing uh, going to trial. And um, so, we, you know, so we got prepared. We had to go down there that morning, I think it was around 10 o'clock, I was supposed to go down there, and around 6 o'clock in the morning, we got raided by the FBI the second time. Um, the first time was kind of a flop, I'm not going to go into too much of that, but you know, we were not really expecting it. The second time we were ready for it, so, um, or as ready for it as you can be. So, um, and that day of action thing, and let me back up. So leading up to, we put the, the call out for the day of action for like a week prior to something like that, and then um, the media in Portland, which they were just kind of always on our case all the time, um, they were just in hysterics over it. They were talking, the day of action, you know, the police are going to lock down downtown, these people are going to burn down every building in downtown, and all this stuff, and you see these, and I wish I had this PowerPoint thing, but I have some old VHS recordings of just these newscasters that are just dick fucking ridiculous, you know, and they're just like forgetting everyone in a panic about how, you know, we're going to destroy downtown Portland on this day of action, and all it really was was a press conference, but it was playing into our hands because, that, you know, we're getting a lot of news coverage around it. And so then the raid happened, and who knows how else it was playing in our hands, because the FBI could have tipped or done something to like to encourage them to do a lot of coverage and create a lot of hysteria prior to their raid, which is actually really likely. But anyway, when the raid happened, they didn't have any um, 
warrant for me. It was just an informational raid, so uh, th in that type of situation you have a choice. You can either stay exactly put where they want you to, which is usually some of you where you can't see what they're doing and what they're taking from your house at all, or you can leave and not come back until they're done. I had two other roommates there with me, and I stayed for a while, and then I, th I thought about it, and it was getting close to 10 o'clock when the press conference was supposed to happen, and I said, you know, I'm going to go down to the press office that you guys are cool with staying here, and they were like, yeah. So I got on my bicycle, I told the they took me like a half an hour to like search me before I left the house, whatever, but I got on my bicycle and rode down to the press conference, and then I was a little late, because I had to stop to Kinko's and send out like a alert, email alert about the raid at that moment on the way down there, so I got a little late, and then um, as soon as I got there I just told the, I told the media right away, you know, our house is being raided right now, um, you know, and I said everything really quick, just spit everything out about Frank's case, and and this and that, and, and, and uh, we led them back. I, they followed me on my bicycle, including helicopter cameras on my bicycle, back to our house. And as the FBI agents were all exiting the house, um, indie media, as well as all the, uh, the local TV stations were there filming their faces. And they came out with boxes over their faces, boxes of our computers and files over their faces, trying to block the camera. And then recently, I just saw a, a Freedom of Information Act FBI document that talked about how upset they were that they got their faces on the news, but um, all this stuff, like the, the case of what I'm trying to get at is Marie's action, you know, you can look at it like one million dollars or whatever, like this is significant, or the first time genetic engineering is significant, this is, these things are significant in profound ongoing ways, um, and what Marie and others have been able to do isn't just done like on their own, like if, if it's just three or five or two or even one person that goes out and does this spectacular thing, they're able to do that because of support built from communities of people who understand the necessity of that kind of thing, who are willing to create a support network and base for that type of action and recognize that, um, that the, the, the problems that we're facing warrant this type of action and this, this level of resistance. And um, I think it's really significant when we're saying about Marie in particular, about how she's not just seeing, she's not worried about this just about herself. And you've seen this over and over with some other people too. You know, what, what you want out there, if you're still committed to the cause, is that you, know, you don't just want to get out and live the rest of your life on some beach, you know, fanning yourself. You want to, um, you want the same thing that you were fighting for before you went into prison, which is a strong community that's taking care of its own problems, that's like keeping these oppressive institutions in check, and, and really creating the kind of world that we want to live in. And so, without going on any more than this gadget is telling me to go on, um, <laughs> I'm just going to wrap it up. Um, and just let everyone know that, that Maria's case and Eric's case and the movements that you're all involved in right here and now are extremely significant. We have the ability to change this world. Whether or not it seems like we're, uh, we're all being punished and, and sent to prison and we're scared of this draconian like, post-9-11 nonsense, it's all nonsense. Like, it, when it gets to the breaking point, we can all just like, turn this thing around so quick. Everything in this society is built off of our backs with our labor, with our work, with our money. And there's very few people that have really, really benefited from this. And so when we get to the point where we really understand the scenario and are ready to take the type of action that's necessary, then it's all going to change. Thank you to these people. Thank you. And now, after all that, Jimmy's going to talk about doing long term prisoner support. Yeah, that was actually a really great segment. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. so that nice. um, that's exactly why we're here. We want to talk about how to build that culture that Leslie was referring to and how to make people um, understand that this is what we're talking about. We're here for the long haul and we want to see this change continue. And for us, part of that, obviously, is prisoner support. Um, we're going to talk now a little bit about prisoner support, but before we jump into the nuts and bolts of that, we wanted to touch briefly on a couple of things that are very interrelated to that. Um, one is that people who accept prisoner support will be vilified for it by the government. And the second one is that people who do prisoner support are also vilified for it by the government and targeted by the state. Um, the first point we've made a couple of times already tonight um, specifically, when I was telling you earlier about Eric's case and how they were talking about prisoner support during his bail hearings, um, the alerts that we sent out were showing up in discovery, all that fun stuff. And that sort of treatment continued throughout the trial and appeal stage. 
In their appeal brief, the government said, McDavid is unrepentant, and he seeks financial and moral support from the same coalition that is anti-government, pro-direct action. The prosecution in Marie's case did the exact same thing. Um, in the sentencing memorandum that they filed before Marie's sentencing, they said, although it might generally be unfair to infer a negative based on the nature of a person's supporters, doing so in this instance is appropriate because Ms. Mason has actively embraced that support. What becomes apparent from a review of various internet postings is that the extremist community is populated by paranoid fanatics who confuse the prosecution of a career arsonist with the persecution of a political activist, who imagine that they live in a totalitarian police state and who have no regard for the law. Um, I really love that quote, but you know, it's very clear here that they're trying to use her support against her. This is clearly an attempt to scare defendants away from prisoner support groups, to drive wedges between us, and to alienate people from their communities. And these attempts must be recognized for what they are. Sometimes this is easier for those of us on the outside, but for folks on the inside, this can actually be incredibly complicated because they're the ones that have to deal with the ramifications of this. Probably the most important, important component of any strategy around this issue is that prisoners have an understanding before spending any time behind bars of what it actually means to accept prisoner support. And if they're not comfortable with the implications, which is totally fine, um, they should just say, say so from the get-go. And that can prevent a lot of sticky situations in the future. The second point that prisoner support itself is targeted by the state was made obvious when we received Eric's Freedom, freedom of Information, or FOIA file, um, at least the parts that hadn't been redacted. There were copies of flyers we distributed for fundraisers, report backs from informants who attended our events, and perhaps most disturbing were the possibly hundreds of pages we received documenting Eric's correspondence from people when he was at the Sacramento County Main Jail. These letters were not just kept on file. The Sacramento Jail forwarded all of them to the Sacramento FBI field office, which then forwarded them to local field offices around the country and to law enforcement internationally. They warned the FBI and other cities of a possible environmental or animal rights extremist or a possible anarchist extremist in their community. Originally, the FBI's communications contained a statement that said, Sacramento is forwarding this communication for information purposes only, which I'm sure is very reassuring to everybody here. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, they began including a much longer statement, which read in part, this information has been determined to be of such a nature that some follow-up as to the possibility of criminal activity is warranted. These statements were included no matter what the content of the letter. In fact, many of the documents included the statement that the letter was benign in nature. Clearly, there was nothing threatening in these letters. Anybody who wrote Eric during his time at Sacramento County in jail needs to know that this was definitely reported to their local FBI field office. So some would claim that the government's attacks on prisoner support are simply a sign that the government fears their effectiveness. Of course, the government would try to scare a defendant away from their support group. The group that raises funds for their defense, which keeps them connected to their friends and family, which challenges the conditions of their confinement, and works to drum up support for them in the wider community. The government's reaction should really come as no surprise to us. We should be prepared for such attacks. And if the government is going to try to use support against people, we better make sure that we are at least as effective as they think we are. If accepting prisoner support is a risk, we need to ensure that it's a risk worth taking. So we want to talk really briefly about prisoner support, kind of like prisoner support 101. Um, we really want to focus more on long-term support, but we wanted to quickly go over this. Hopefully some folks here have at least a little bit of familiarity with these things. Um, obviously the most important thing to do when somebody is arrested is to contact them. Um, usually this means going to the jail, which is not a lot of fun, but necessary. And, you know, we need to contact them, find out if they want support. Like I said earlier, some people don't, and that's absolutely fine, but we need to know that. And then we need to figure out what their needs are and how to help them meet those needs. And we also need to make sure that they know what their rights are, and we also need to contact their friends and family and make sure that they also know what their rights are because the cops will definitely be contacting their friends and family. And so we want to make sure that people know how to handle these interactions when they happen. We can also help folks find an attorney. We can fundraise for attorneys. We actually do lots of fundraising, right? We fundraise for commissary and people to visit and phone calls. 
lots and lots of court support, um, going to bail hearings, going to motion hearings, going to trial, going to sentencing. Websites and email lists can be set up. Um, we need to be ever cognizant of the fact, of course, that we are never alone, right? We're not the only ones that read these websites and read these emails. The government will definitely be reading them too and definitely searching them for anything they can use against our friends and loved ones. So we need to be very careful about what we say in these emails and websites. And this should also be kept in mind when writing letters. Um, somebody asked us during our first talk, how do you write a letter to a prisoner? Um, so we wanted to go over that briefly. Again, hopefully folks have some familiarity with this, but a couple of quick things. Um, probably the two most important things are, number one, don't talk about illegal activity, right? Yours or anybody else's. Um, the government definitely reads all of these letters and would love to hear about your illegal activity and everyone else's. Also, um, don't talk about a person's case. It's just generally a bad idea and not really necessary to talk to them. Um, so stay away from that conversation as well. A lot of prisons and jails also have rules about what kind of ink you can use. They don't want you to use colored ink. Um, they don't want you to include glitter in the letters, which is tragic. Um, <laughs> don't send Polaroid pictures. Sometimes you can't send certain kinds of books if you want to send people books. Um, at Sac County, they didn't want you to send true crime novels. Eric had somebody try to send him Tai Chi books once that got sent back because they said they were like, um, you know, self-defense books or something. Probably the I know it's totally crazy. Probably the easiest thing to do is check the jail or the prison's website for these kind of regulations. You can also check a person support site and figure out what can and can be sent in. So all of these things can sort of get us through the crisis period that follows immediately after somebody's arrest. And honestly, we usually stay in crisis mode all the way through trial and through sentencing. But again, what we want to talk more about tonight is how to focus on the long term. We also want to take a minute to remind everyone that our communities are not the first to be targeted with this sort of repression. Um, since its inception, the FBI has made it its mission to disrupt and destroy dissident groups in the United States. Folks like the Black Panther Party, the American Indian Movement, the Puerto Rican Independence folks, all of these groups have been dealing with this kind of repression for a very long time. We would do well to talk to those folks, to learn from them, um, and not reinvent the will. We need to learn from our history. So what are the issues that come up for folks who are in prison for a long amount of time? Obviously, a lot of this seems like common sense, right? Anybody who's in prison for any amount of time, even if it's just a week or a couple of weeks or a month, faces really intense isolation from their communities, from their friends, and from their families. Now take this and multiply it by about 20 years. Maintaining relationships with people is really hard, even for those of us on the outside who are uninhibited by things like steel and concrete. Now imagine trying to do that with no cell phone or, you know, God forbid, no Facebook. Um, it's really hard to maintain relationships with people. Think about, for instance, folks like Daniel McGowan who are in communications management units. Um, if you don't know about CMUs, there's literature about them in the back. You should definitely check it out. Um, but Daniel McGowan is a Green Scare prisoner who only gets one 15-minute phone call a week. So if you can only call one person that you know and love a week, who do you call? Do you call your mom or your dad? Do you call your son or your daughter? Do you call your wife? Um, these are the kinds of decisions and the kind of isolation that people are dealing with on a daily basis. Or imagine you're Marie and your family has to fly 1,200 miles to visit you. They have to pay for airfare, they have to pay for a rental car, they have to pay for a hotel um, just to visit their loved one. And we need to make sure that people are able to do this, that we're able to facilitate maintaining these connections and keeping people involved in these nourishing relationships. And obviously with time comes change, right? People's families get older, people on the outside get sick, people on the inside get sick, people die, people are born. Um, Danny McGowan has lost a parent since he's been in prison. It's a really terrible thing to go through for anybody. Now imagine trying to do that without even having the ability to be present for that. Um, Eric's actually had the opposite problem. His sister has gotten married and had two kids since he went to prison. And it's been really difficult for him to not be involved in his niece's lives in the way that he wants to be. And of course the world changes, and for people who are so often intensely and intimately involved in trying to make that change happen, feeling like they're not able to be a part of that anymore can be really frustrating and painful. So it seems like a lot of our prisoner support work in the past has been focused on meeting the very real material needs of our comrades, and that certainly doesn't disappear, right? I think in a lot of ways 
um, trying to keep up with that material support gets even weightier and definitely more sustained. But what becomes most important at some point, I think, is figuring out how to keep folks emotionally and psychologically supported. And again, we don't have all the answers here, but we wanted to get this conversation started. One thing that I have personally heard from numerous folks is that they are always craving news from the outside. Information about environmental campaigns or Occupy or any of the struggles that folks were involved in before they went to prison. Think about how we get most of our information now. It's all online. Um, people in prison don't have access to that. They get all of their news from, you know, shitty Fox or like whatever crappy newspaper they happen to have access to. So actually something that can be really important for them is Print off articles online from your favorite news, um, from your favorite blog or commentary. Anything about stuff, struggles that they held near and dear to their hearts can help them feel more connected um, and a little less distant from the things that they care about. Another really important thing for folks is making sure that their families and loved ones are taken care of. Eric has told me over and over again that the hardest thing for him about being in prison is worrying about everybody on the outside. And it sounds like Marie has the same problem, right? If you heard the letter that, that Ian read earlier about Marie, um, that's a reoccurring theme for folks. So what we want to do is make sure that people are able to visit, that they're able to get those phone calls, and they're able to maintain those connections. And yes, this probably means more fundraising, which everybody hates, right? But it's really important, and we need to make sure that we're keeping up with that. We also need to ensure that our comrades on the inside are able to stay involved in the movements, communities, and struggles of which they gave, for which they gave up their freedom. Just because they're locked away from us does not mean that they cannot be an integral part of our movements and struggles. We need to be constantly figuring out ways to do this and to do it effectively. We should always be asking for their input and analysis, and their voices should always be prominent in our struggles. So I asked Eric to write up something about what he sees as important for long-term support, and this is what he had to say. In looking at long-term prisoner support, my very biased perspective first turns to the tangible yet implicit intents created by the structures of incarceration. The symptoms which manifest themselves give me an idea of the illness I'm dancing with. One, amongst numerous others, has popped up consistently throughout these past six years of imprisonment. How the impact of not being around friends and family attempts to eat away at my very core. By using incarceration as a tool to remove folks from their communities, the trauma of isolation also manifests as a reciprocal void within the individual. If the person has not explored and nourished an authentic relation to who they truly are, their psyche will compensate to fill the void with something in their immediate environment. In prison, those fillers end up being structures which are a part of what binds them. The choices of McIntosh and Bond come to mind. So far as the translation to long-term prisoner support, a saying I picked up from somewhere floats to the surface. Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. I can imagine a change in the way some folks have been reacting to imprisonment if local prisoner groups made it a priority to see that prisoners within their reach have full visit schedules while providing space for their loved ones to participate as well. Receiving visits from those who know your heart and carry similar interests revalidates and aids in the processing of imprisonment while reinforcing who you are. It's also a gift, a tangible view of the world beyond the concrete and steel which saturates incarceration. This isn't 100% by any means, one of my co-defendants being an example, but I feel that folks living, in, living moment by moment in an environment of captivity bent on traumatization and regression will have a larger chance of surviving with their integrity intact if those types of relationships they held dear on the outside are maintained and nourished. One other thing I wanted to touch on all too briefly is post-release support. Um, this is actually something that's incredibly important and probably deserves its own tour. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Maybe sometime in the future, we'll be back. Um, but obviously folks who come out of prison are usually starting with basically nothing. And they are also potentially attempting to heal from a very traumatizing situation. This is an uphill battle, and we should definitely make sure that we're not leaving our friends in the dust. Yes, somebody getting released from prison is obviously a huge cause for celebration, and I don't want to gloss over that at all. But this is not the end of their struggle with imprisonment. We absolutely cannot think that support ends when a prison term ends. Everybody has different needs upon release, but everyone should have, at the very, very least, a decent chunk of cash to get started, help finding a place to live or a job, and finding access to resources like healthcare, mental and physical, if they want it. 
A fair amount of folks have been released in the last few years, and I fear that many of them have not gotten the support that they need and deserve. This needs to be remedied ASAP. And, folks, and for folks who are in for even longer, like Eric and Marie, um, these needs will probably be even more intense. So again, that's why we're here tonight. We're going to talk about how to start doing this work. And in that vein, we're going to hand it over to Ian, and he's going to start talking about culture of resistance. So as Jenny said, long-term support of prisoners is critically important. But we're not here to say that we want our work to end there. How did our friends get to prison in the first place? They got there as a result of struggle, and the struggle that they're a part of needs to be continued. We need to make prisoners support one aspect of these struggles so that we can continue not only to support our friends, but to uh, support their work to build a better world. What do we want? We want to create communities where people are so invested in one another that they would rather stick with their communities than snitch on their friends to save themselves where people can feel comfortable taking action, knowing that they'll be taken care of if they run into repression as a result. This can both keep us all safer and make our work more effective. What is a culture of resistance? Uh, despite our recent discovery that there's a chapter in the Deep Green Resistance book by this title, <laughs> it's not about Deep Green Resistance, and it's not about armed struggle. It can contain many components. For example, material support and solidarity, the creation of communities of care, and security culture. All of these things are connected, or they should be. As Jenny said, we're in it for the long haul. We want you to be too. Eric and Marie certainly are. What do we need for this to happen, for us all to be able to be in it for the long haul? Many people who have flipped in the past had already dropped out of the communities and movements they came from by the time they got around to cooperating. How did this happen? Some of them had a lack of investment in these communities to begin with. Maybe they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Maybe they were there for the wrong reasons. But even among those who were passionately involved when they were younger, a lot don't stick around. This happens a lot. I'm going to guess a few reasons why. For one thing, many activist communities have different values placed on different kinds of work, some of which are contingent on, for example, physical ability. If the only stories that we ever tell are ones that involve um, running really quickly down the street, Maybe those who aren't physically able to do that are going to have a harder time feeling like their contributions and what they have to offer are valued, or that the work they do matters. In fact, we need to value everyone's contributions, because the support of those who are doing infrastructural work allows the people who do the more sexy physical kinds of actions to be able to do the work that they do. Many places and communities of activists have a certain social focus on youth. It's kind of natural on the one hand, because a lot of folks tend to skew kind of young. But on the other hand, as folks get older, maybe they won't be able to like stay out all night or do some of the kinds of crazy run around town things that really young folks like to do. There's not anything wrong with doing these things, but we do need to make sure that people don't feel left out or excluded. As people get older, often they move into different phases of their lives. Maybe they have children. Maybe they have sick relatives that they need to take care of. Maybe they run into financial problems and find that they need more money to survive than they do when they were younger. Maybe they run into mental or physical health problems. Many of these people find that we and our communities are no longer meeting their needs, and they turn to capitalism to meet them instead. What is it that people need? How can we help take care of these things? Childcare and intergenerationality are critically important, both for the continued involvement of parents and for the future investment of the kids who grow up in these movements. If they feel like these communities and their movements are theirs and important to them, they can continue to do the work in the future as they grow. If people have responsibilities they need help with, we need to meet and figure out how to help them meet these responsibilities. If people are having money trouble, people need to get together and figure out how to help them make rent. A lot of the time, if people get caught up in these things, they simply can't be involved anymore because they're too busy trying to deal with them. As they say, teamwork makes the dream work. If we get together, maybe we can try to figure out how to help. If someone is feeling burned out or depressed, or having a hard time, we need to figure out how to help them too, especially how to refocus their anger and hatred toward the society that creates the conditions that often makes them feel that way. We need to help our friends, to hold each other up. We are all in this together. We need to support each other materially, but more than that, we need to give each other what capitalism can't offer us. We'll never be able to compete with capitalism in the sheer amount of shiny things that they, can tell, that they can throw at us and tell us that we need. We can offer things that they can't. As we've discovered over the last, I don't know, several decades, 
It isn't actually buying increasing amount of shiny things that makes people happy. It's real communities, real care, and real support. We can offer people these things. We need to do that. We're not calling for false unity here. Some conflicts need to happen. Some of them, in fact, need to be pushed. We are calling for taking care of one another and each other's needs. Material solidarities to constitute a common material force. This isn't a call for self-care as an excuse for inaction, although caring for oneself can be important. Taking care of one another can be a component of attacking the things in this world that create the situations that trip people up. This stuff is hard. We need to remind each other of why we are here and why we do what we do. And we have to keep doing it. We have to prioritize the attack. We have to create bonds so strong that people would rather die or go to prison than break them. Friendship is what is worth living for. Friendship can be a weapon. Let's make it count. So part of that, part of supporting each other, is um, treating each other with basic respect, right? And respecting each other's boundaries. It seems like an obvious point, but it's been sort of a problem. It's always a terrible idea to push people to action if they are reluctant. Um, some people are very persistent, like Anna, for, existent, for example. Um, this is basically like peer pressure on steroids. Quite simply, it's not something a good friend would do. And if some, somebody is pushing others to action, action with which they are clearly uncomfortable, that person is not worthy of friendship or trust. Abusive bullies have no place in our movements and communities. Whether or not they are working as informants, these people are disrupt, disruptive and destructive to the work that we do. We need to be clear that they are not welcome. This not only makes us safer from government spying, it also makes us healthier within our own communities. And the healthy we are, healthier we are, the more able we are to do the work that matters to us. On a similar note, we need to ensure that things like bragging and bravado have no place as well. People who talk about illegal activities that they or others they know have engaged in create serious security problems. I'm sure we can all think of a couple of people that, that do stuff like this in our lives. I can think of two off the top of my head, Anna and Lauren. Um, both were very, very bad about this. Lauren, in particular, loved to talk about illegal activity that she and other people had been involved in. Um, some of this was actually lies. She went on record later telling the FBI that she was lying about some of this stuff. But regardless of that, she was talking to the FBI um, through Anna. She didn't know it at the time, but Anna was wearing the wire. So she was basically feeding the FBI information about all of her friends and all of the illegal activity they had engaged in. We want to create communities where people have a strong sense of self and don't feel like they need to do this to prove themselves to others. Another thing we need to do is make sure that we are ready when the government comes at us with their cointel pro behavior. Um, this is a document from Well Politics <coughs> Reads that we read. It's from a FOIA file um, in which a government informant is talking to an FBI agent about the animal rights movement. And they say the animal rights movement does little research on newcomers into the movement and basically goes with its gut instinct as to whether a person is an informant or not. Organizers of the animal rights movement can be discredited and removed from the scene by planting rumors that they are plants and or informants. Um, clearly, they know that this works, and we need to be really careful about rumor control. Rumor control can become really complicated when we're trying to support our comrades in prison, because often lines of communication with them are extremely hampered by the state. This is why it is essential that nothing be reported on as fact until there is undeniable documentation about a person's status as a cooperator, for example, a plea agreement. We should never make assumptions about what a person in prison is doing